Thank you for this great introduction and good morning and thank you all for being here. Um, I think I'm going to fall into the category of the hard technical talk. <laughs> so um, I hope everybody has, has had a lot of coffee. Uh, well, as Vincent said, my name is Amina and like everybody here, I love rackets. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about is a programming language built on top of Racket that I've been working on for the last four years or so. So as you all know uh, from Matthias's keynote, uh, Racket is a programmable programming language. What does that mean? Well, it means that it allows you to easily create your own programming languages, especially domain-specific languages or DSLs. What's nice about DSLs, what it allows you to package the knowledge that you have about a given domain into a programming language so other people can use it uh, and take advantage of it and um, solve problems in the domain more easily. So once you have built your programming language using Racket, another thing that you might want to do is create some tools for it. So what kind of tools, maybe debuggers, maybe a verifier. If you don't know what a verifier is, for now you can think of it as an exhaustive testing tool and many other tools. Rosette is a language built on top of Racket, so to you it will look much like Racket, except for a few additional constructs that you will see during the talk um, that allows you to build these tools very quickly and very efficiently. In particular, you can build tools such as verification, which as I said, you can think of as exhaustive testing, but also very advanced tools such as tools for program synthesis. These tools allow the end user to specify what they want the program to do at a very high level, and the synthesis engine will synthesize the low level code or the code in your DSL that implements that specification. Now, all of this magic happens, as you will see, uh, with the aid of uh, advanced automated theorem provers, uh, which are also known as, as SAT or SMT solvers. So uh, I usually call Rosette a solver-aided programming language. Now, if many or some percentage of these words don't make sense to you yet, don't worry, that's what the talk is about. It will all become clear very soon. Uh, but before I get into the hard technical part of the talk, uh, let me give you a little bit of motivation uh, behind the work. How I started doing it, what motivated it, what kind of things you can expect to be eventually able to do uh, if you start programming in this paradigm. Uh, so normally when we think of programmers, uh, we think of people like us who are highly sophisticated, who know how to um, you know, write loops, recursion, none of that is a problem for us. Uh, but in the real world, it turns out that uh, almost any knowledge worker has to do some kind of programming today in order to do their job effectively. Uh, so let me give you three examples of people whom you may not think of as programmers naturally. So social scientists, uh, the way that they do their work these days is essentially collect data from social networking sites and analyze it. Well, before you can analyze the data, the first thing that you have to do is put it into some format that's analyzable, right? So if you have a bunch of phone numbers uh, which are in all sorts of different formats, maybe you want to uh, put them into the same format with dashes and so on. Now this is easy if you're a programmer, well, relatively easy, right? You can probably write some kind of a nasty regular expression that will do this for you. Uh, but if you're not a programmer, this is very difficult. People will actually do this manually. What they would like to do instead is demonstrate on a few examples of the data how to perform the transformation, so give input-output pairs, and have a system synthesize a program that you can apply to the rest of the data. So this is what social scientists would like, some kind of a synthesis system, for example, uh, that could help them transform their data very easily just by demonstrating how they want it transformed. Now, biologists, um, it turns out that uh, what they're doing these days uh, a lot is they would like to have computer models that explain um, how various processes in cells and organisms work. These computer models are useful because they can tell them what next experiment to run in the wet lab. For them, unlike for us, running experiments is really expensive. So you really want to run the ones that are most likely to disambiguate between hi competing hypotheses that explain the real world. So what they would like to do, instead of trying to code up these programs on their own, is give the computer the results of their experiments, the mutation they, they apply to the organism and the outcome, what happened to it, how it developed, and have the computer synthesize a model, essentially a program, that explains uh, those outcomes. And finally, uh, our friends hardware designers or hardware engineers 
are now these uh, constructing and building a lot of different chips. And the reason, of course, is that uh, improving performance. And in particular, they're creating chips that are low energy and highly parallel. Now, a chip is no good if you can't program it. And in order to program it, you need to have certain abstractions, such as cache coherence protocols or memory consistency models. These you can also think of as programs. They're essentially logical specifications, and they're extremely hard to create by hand. So hardware designers would also like to have tools, both synthesis and verification, that can help them create these abstractions uh, that protect programmers and compiler writers from the very low level details uh, of what their chip is doing. Now these are all possible things, possible <coughs> applications that you can do with an automated theorem prover, where you can do with technologies such as verification and synthesis. And um, the main problem is really that the gap between the people who want to use these tools and building the tools themselves is very hard. In fact, for all of the examples that I've just listed, a bunch of very smart people have spent a lot of time and they have actually built these tools. Um, in fact, if you build one, most of the time you will get a popular PLDI paper. If you're not in the academic community, that's pretty hard. I think the acceptance rate is what, hovering around 20%? So it takes a lot of work to build one of these tools. Uh, it takes a lot of time, a lot of expertise, and clearly, if we want to make them widely available and accessible to everyone else, we need to do something different. We need a better way of building them. And this is where Rosette comes in. Rosette is essentially a racket-based language, a solver-aided language <coughs> that allows anybody without any training and formal methods, so that's basically the field in which we develop these automated theorem provers to build tools of the kind that I just described, program verification and synthesis. So here's what I'm gonna do in the rest of the talk. First, uh, I will give you a slightly more formal, slightly more precise definition of what these solver-aided tools are and give you an intuition of how they actually work. Um, that will also show you what is hard about building them from scratch. Uh, the next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about solver-aided languages, in particular Rosette, we will see a very simple uh, example of, a, of how to build um, verifier, synthesizer, and a debugger for a toy programming language, and we'll do all of that in less than 50 lines of code. And finally, I will tell you about some recent applications of Rosette, uh, three of them in particular. Uh, it has been publicly available since 2014. There are many applications, but I'll talk about the three most recent ones. Um, that are kind of exciting and that show the range of what we can do with this sort of thing. All right, so let's start with the tools. Uh, normally, when you program, your world looks a little bit like this. So you got this little guy here, the programmer. You have a specification in your mind. You have some idea of what it is that you want the computer to do, and you write a piece of code which hopefully implements that idea. And when you're programming, how do you check that what you have written corresponds to what you have in your mind. What do you do? This is a room full of programmers. You all do it. I hope <laughs> you all do it. <laughs> you test it, exactly. So in this case, I'm going to uh, basically say that, you know, we're, we're very formal, we're very good, we're gonna write assertions. Uh, so I wrote some predicate safe uh, that basically returns true if P produces a correct output on a given input, and I say assert safe P of two, which basically means that I'm testing that P has the correct behavior on a specific input, in this case two. So that's what testing is. You have a huge input space, you sample it for a few inputs that you think are interesting, uh, and you check that your program behaves correctly on those inputs. Now something interesting happens when you have access to an automated theorem prover or a solver. You can actually now ask questions about the behavior of your program with respect to the spec that you have on all inputs. Even if the space is very huge, let's say 32-bit integers, 64-bit integers, um, the, the solver can actually answer these questions efficiently even on enormous spaces. Um, so how does it work? Uh, well, essentially what happens is we translate a question about the program behavior into a set of logical constraints that the solver knows how to solve. So in this case, we're asking the solver to find an input on which the program fails. Uh, and essentially, you can uh, think of it as solving this formula. If you have forgotten your first order logic, 
Um, what this says here is there exists an X such that um, when we apply safe to P of X, uh, the result is false, right? So such an X exists only if this assertion can be violated. So what the solver will do is if, there's such, if such an X exists, even in a huge space, it will find it and it will return it to you. So you will have a concrete counterexample, a concrete input on which your program violates the spec, which is really cool, right? Okay, so now that you have an input on which the program violates the spec, the solver found it for you. And actually, if anybody found an input for you that violates uh, the spec of your program, what would you do next? Well, before you can fix it, what do you have to do? <laughs> Something more boring. <laughs> Another test. You, you also actually have to debug it, right? You have to localize the fault. You have to find out what's wrong uh, with the program. And it turns out that the solver can help uh, with that as well. And the process is exactly the same. Uh, we're going to formulate the qu a query that we want to answer about this program as a logical query, and the solver will answer it. In this case, we're saying that um, the solver is supposed to f uh, find a solution to this formula. X is equal to 42. and P when applied to X is safe. Is this statement true? No, definitely not. We know that from the verification <laughs> query. So this formula is what we call unsatisfiable. There is no X which will satisfy this, which will make it true. Uh, it turns out that in that case, the solver can also return something useful. Well, it's no longer a value, it's not an input. It is something that we call a minimal unsatisfiable core. When you map that thing, which is actually itself a set of constraints, back onto constructs that are meaningful in your programming language, what you get is a minimal set of expressions such that you have to fix at least one of those in order to make the program pass. So it's a form of fault localization. So let's say in this case, x plus two is the buggy one. That's the one that has to be fixed. So we now have two options. If uh, for whatever reason this failed at runtime, uh, we might want to recover from it dynamically. Uh, so it turns out that you can also call the solver at runtime. I don't recommend it. Uh, this poor thing is solving an MP hard problem at best, sometimes undecidable. But you know, if you're really desperate, uh, you can call it at runtime and you essentially get something that we call angelic execution. So this call to this function choose, this magic function choose, it returns a value at runtime such that all the assertions downstream are going to pass. So essentially the solver is, is acting as an omniscient oracle. If there is such a value, the solver will return it. Of course, if you don't want to call the solver at runtime, which is the right thing to do, um, you can actually ask the solver to repair this program for you as well. So this part is called synthesis. What we do is we replace the buggy expression with those double question marks. And this instructs the solver to search for an expression such that when you substitute the expressions for those double question marks, the program is going to behave correctly on all inputs. So now we're, now we're solving a much more complicated formula. Uh, as you've seen in the beginning, we only had one quantifier. Now we have this doubly nested quantifier. So it says there exists an expression E such that for all inputs x, uh, when you substitute e for the double question mark, p is safe on x. <coughs> so this is more formally, more precisely, what solver-aided tools are and what kind of facilities they give you, what, are, what, what kind of questions you can answer with the help of a solver about your program. So what do you think is hard about writing one of those boxes? If I asked you right now, to build one of these tools, what would you have to do? <laughs> yeah, you, you would have to do that. Uh, but let's say the solver can do that for you. But in order to ask the solver a question, what do you have to do? Hmm? Exactly. You have to build this box that's going to take the semantics of your programming language and turn it into logical formulas. Writing this box, this symbolic compiler, if you want to think about it that way, right, which emits instead of x86 code, it basically emits these constraints, is what's really hard. This requires a huge amount of time and a huge amount of expertise. And essentially what Rosette allows you to do is to get all of these tools without ever building this compiler. You implement your DSL 
in Racket or Rosette. To you, it looks the same. And you basically get the symbolic compiler for free. Uh, and the way that we can do that is because Rosette runs on a non-standard virtual machine, which is called a symbolic virtual machine. I will tell you in the latter part of the talk how the, the SVM actually works. Um, but this little bit of magic is what enables Rosette to translate not only a program in your DSL, but also your DSL interpreter, the semantics of your DSL, to constraints. And that's basically the hard technical problem that we had to solve in order to make this possible. And uh, if you're into reading really dry, boring technical papers, these two uh, contain all the details. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk more generally about this idea of solver-aided languages, and I'm gonna show you what it is that Rosette adds to Racket. Then we will see an example of building this tiny little language within Rosette, uh, and then I will actually tell you how Rosette works. How it actually manages to generate these constraints and how to, how it manages to flatten the stack of a programming language on top of a programming, uh, or, or on top of an interpreter down to constraints efficiently for you. Um, all right, so this picture is going to be familiar to anybody who's seen Matthias' keynote. Uh, the main specific language is just um, usually um, a limited kind of language that's usually high level, uh, and it's implemented by writing a library or an interpreter in a host language. The host language itself is usually a general purpose language, and if you're very lucky, it has nice meta programming features. If you're not lucky, you do it in C. <laughs> so here are some examples of DSLs and host languages uh, that might look familiar to you. In fact, I'm pretty sure that everyone in this room has used at least one DSL, and you have all definitely used some general purpose languages. So why bother with DSLs? Uh, why not just you know, write your code in general purpose languages? Clearly, whatever you can write in a DSL, you can write in general purpose language, right? Uh, the reason is twofold. First, uh, the main specific languages offer you a high level of abstraction, uh, which means that to, you can accomplish the same amount of work, you can finish the same task with much less code. Much less code, fewer opportunities for bugs. So here's matrix multiplication is in, in, in a DSL called Eigen. Here is the same thing in C++ or Java. Clearly, you would prefer to write something on the top. Now, the other thing that's important from our point of view, in fact, from the point of view of any kind of a tool builder, not just solver a tool, even compiler builders, um, the main specific languages, because they are restricted, uh, they also have special properties that a tool that works on them can take advantage of that a general purpose tool or a compiler cannot. In this example, uh, this Eigen compiler, if there was one, would know that matrix multiplication is associative. It can use it to generate better code. Uh, there's no way that you can recover this in general from general purpose code. So that's why DSLs are great. They offer you higher level abstractions, they give you nice tools to solve problems in a given domain, and they allow you to generate better code. And it turns out that these properties of the DSLs that a compiler can take advantage of, um, our tools, solver aided tools can as well, in order to reduce the search space and make the job easier for solver. This is why we <laughs> like DSLs. Um, so, in the solver-aided stack, the picture looks exactly the same, except that, as I mentioned before, we're now going to run on a slightly different virtual machine. It's not going to be a standard virtual machine anymore, it's going to be this SVM. And um, Rosette is only one of solver-aided host languages that exists. There are two more at this point, I think, uh, but we're gonna be focusing on Rosette. Uh, and here are some DSLs or SDSL, solver aided DSLs that have been built with Rosette. I'm not going to talk, this is just a small sample of that, I'm not going to talk about all of them because we don't have time, uh, but towards the end of the talk, I will uh, briefly mention three of them which will kind of give you an idea of the range of tools or range of domains to which you can apply this successfully. Um, so, Rosette is, as I said at the beginning, built on top of Racket, and in particular, it adds to Racket D6 construct. 
I will let you stare at them for a while. Uh, I'm not going to define them formally. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to show you how to use them in an example. So here's the example. Uh, the thing that we're going to do is we're going to build a little toy DSL. It's going to be a low-level DSL. I'm going to call it BV, which stands for bit vectors. Uh, and it's going to be a tiny assembly-like language that allows you to write fast low-level library functions. Right? Uh, this particular example that you see on the slide, uh, it takes a maximum of two 32-bit integers without doing any branching, which is kind of cool. So what would you like to do with uh, this little programming language? Well, obviously, you want to be able to run and test it. Even if you verify things, you should definitely test them, always. You want to be able to debug them if they're wrong. You want to be able to verify them, and you want to be able to synthesize uh, programs in this little language. How are we going to do it? Uh, well, I will show you how to build interpreter for this language. It's going to be about 10 lines of code, and everything else is going to be more or less for free. All right. So, I'll show you how the interpreter works uh, uh, by, run, by essentially running through this example. We're going to try to take BV max of minus two and minus one. So the first thing that happens, of course, we parse the language. Uh, we create an AST. I'm using a very simple representation here. My program is a list of lists. Uh, each list represents an instruction in the program. Uh, the first value is the value of the output register for that instruction. The second value is a racket symbol, which tells you which instruction to run. And the remaining values are the identifiers for the input registers. Right? So super simple AST. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to feed this into our interpreter. So it takes as input an AST, and it takes as input the inputs to the program. So minus two, minus one. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to allocate enough <laughs> registers to run this program. It's just going to be a racket vector. And I can tell how many register I need, registers I need in this simple programming language by ju just by counting the number of instructions. This is in so-called static, static single assignment or SSA form. And then I'm going to populate the first n register with the, with the, fir with the n inputs of the program, in this case, minus two, minus one. So far, so good. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to um, use Racket's pattern matching uh, to buy, um, to essentially deconstruct the first instruction, right? So I'm going to bind the local variable out to the value two, uh, the opcode to the symbol BVGE, and the input variable to the list that contains zero and one. So to Racket people, this is super easy to read, right? <laughs> this is so easy. Normally when I give a talk, I usually get many more confused looks at this point. <laughs> Um, so the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to eval the opcode in order to get the procedure object that corresponds to the BVG instruction. <laughs> um, finally, I'm going to load all the values from these registers into this local arguments variable. I'm going to apply the procedure to the arguments and store the result in the output register. I will do this for every single instruction in my program and I will return the value that is in the last register as the output of the program. This is super easy, right? Anybody in this room could write this little bit of racket. Now, while this may be easy to program, this is essentially a nightmare for any kind of an automated tool that's trying to reason about this program. It's using really advanced language features, right? So we're using pattern matching, we're using dynamic evaluation, we have first class procedures, high order procedures, side effects. This is really bad. <laughs> so this is what I want you to keep in mind. Rosette has allowed you to write this and it will translate all of this mess to logical constraints. And we will see how this happens uh, shortly. But before we do that, uh, let me actually show you how to implement the tools for this language as I promised, how to do verification and debugging and synthesis for this language. We will see the verification in a little bit uh, in detail uh, for debugging and synthesis. I will show you the code but not walk you through it. It's very similar. I'm showing you the code to convince you that it's a small amount of code. 
But here's how we're gonna implement verification. So there is a verify construct now in our BV language, it's shown in blue. It takes as input an implementation, so BV max, and a specification, a reference implementation, if you will. So I'm not showing you max on the slide, but you can imagine it's an implementation that uses a branch, right? Kind of the straightforward one. So how are we going to verify that these two procedures behave identically on all 32-bit inputs? So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to use this defined symbolic construct to create two symbolic values, two symbolic constants of type integers, the integer which are bound to the local variables n0 and n1. So what is a symbolic constant? What is a symbolic value? Well, you can think of it as a concrete value of the same type. You can use it in the same way. So if it's integer, you can do plus on it. But you don't know its value at runtime the solver will eventually determine the concrete value of the symbolic constant in order to either violate your assertions or satisfy them depending on what kind of query you're asking. But for now, you have just created a racket value, you know it's an integer, you bound it to a variable in zero and you know nothing else about it. You can just, all you know is you can use it as an integer, that's fine. So what does that mean? Uh, well. You can put them in data structures and you can pass them to these procedures, uh, uh, the, the interpret in this, case, in this case which accepts inputs. So this is what define symbolic does. It introduces values, symbolic constants into your program. Rosette supports many of these, uh, so integers, reals, bit vectors, and so on. But this is basically all you need to know in order to use it. So the next thing that you need to do is you need to give the solver some assertions to check. And this is how you, um, and once you do that with this assert statement, you will ask the solver to verify whether there are any concrete values such that when you substitute those concrete values for the symbolic values n0 and n1, this assertion fails, right? So this is the meaning. So verify expression, so you can have an arbitrary rosette slash ex uh, racket expression here. Rosette will execute this symbolically it will collect all possible assertions along all paths, translate it to formulas, and ask the solver whether there is any concrete binding for the symbolic values, symbolic integers, n0 and n1, such that any of those assertions is violated. In this case, there is only one assertion, and in fact, there is a binding that causes a violation. The program is not correct. It will produce the wrong output on the input zero minus two, and you don't have to take my word for it, we can actually run the interpreter, and you will see that it does something very wrong. Does anyone see the bug in this program? <laughs> I know, that's cruel. <laughs> so we're actually gonna ask the solver to, to answer this question for us as well, to basically uh, try, try, try to help us to localize the fault here. As I said, I will not drag you through details, but the principle is the same. We build the tools for our DSL, the queries for our DSL, by using the underlying queries that are provided by Rosette. So ver verify in the DSL becomes verify in Rosette, debug in the DSL becomes debug in Rosette, and so on. In this case, debug takes as input an implementation, a specification, and a concrete input on which the two differ. And it gives you a highlighted set of registers such that you have to change at least one of them in order to make the program pass, in order to make it true. Which one do we change? Well, which one? <laughs> uh, well, we can ask the solver, so we can just replace them. <laughs> I know, that's my answer for everything. Uh, we can replace them with a double question marks. Uh, and the same thing happens. Uh, we have a synthesized construct that takes as input implementation and a specification. Uh, and when we ask the solver to synthesize this, um, we will get the correct registers there. So this is basically how you would use Rosette. You write racket code, in addition to racket, you get asserts, you get defined symbolic, and you get these four queries. So verify, solve, synthesize, and debug. And all of the Rosette programs, all the Rosette applications that we'll talk about later on, they're essentially built in this way. All right, so uh, let me briefly tell you, or maybe not so briefly, um, how this actually works. 
how Rosetta accomplishes this magic. Uh, the high level picture looks like this. Uh, we have a stack of languages here, right? So we have your SDSL, the interpreter for it. We have a program in that language and a query about that program. Uh, Rosette translates all of that to constraints uh, that are then passed to an SMT solver called Z3. Um, when Z3 returns an answer, Rosette lifts that answer. It expresses it in something that's meaningful at the level of programming language. So the solver will give you back a logical answer and Rosette will lift it into a, a meaningful answer, a value or, uh, or expressions in the case of synthesis. The thing that I want to remind the programs that we're allowed to write here, the interpreter and so on, can have all sorts of cool racket features in them. You can use these features. But the hard problem here is to somehow get rid of them and to be able to express the meaning of this program in a very, very simple logic. In our case, we're going to use theories of bit vectors, integers, reals, and uninterpreted functions. If this means nothing to you, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Essentially, it's just a, it's, it's a, these are the most basic theories that, that an SMT uh, solver knows how to reason about. The reason why we go to these most basic theories as opposed to trying to do something more complicated is that it's very, very good at the basic ones and it may not be so good at the more complicated things. So we'll see how this process works, how you go from a program to constraints on an example. And the particular example is going to be this one. We're going to have a little procedure that takes as input a list of integers, it reverses it, and keeps only the positive ones. So if we have a list three, one minus two, we want to output one three. So here's some pseudocode that will accomplish this. Right? The query that we want to ask about this pseudocode, the one that we're going to translate, is essentially we want to ask the solver to execute this procedure uh, on some input, to so basically find an input such that this assertion is satisfied. The length of the output is equal to the length of the input. So, if we have the output A, B, where A and B are symbolic integers, and I'm going to use the convention that symbolic values are shown in color and everything else is shown in black. So if I have a list with two symbolic integers, A and B, and this procedure is supposed to reverse this list and keep only the positive numbers, what properties of A and B have to be true in order for this assertion to be satisfied at the end? That the length of the input, Vs, is equal to the length of the output, Ps. What has to be true? Exactly. So this, is, this constraint fully captures the meaning of this program on this symbolic input. Everybody is agree, agrees with this? Okay. Normally they look much more complicated. <laughs> but this one fits on the slide. All right, so we'll see now how to do that. Uh, before, I, before I show you how Rosette works, um, let me briefly review how people have done this in the past. So the idea of translating program to constraints, I did not invent this, not even close. It's very, very old, decades old. And people have come up with many ways to translate programs to constraints. Roughly speaking, um, when we're dealing with finite programs over finite inputs, which is what Rosette does, because those tend to be decidable, um, then we use one of the two approaches. The first approach is called symbolic execution. And this is how it works. Um, essentially, it executes, it encodes the meaning of these programs one path at a time. So what does that mean? Well, we, we start pretending that we're actually executing this program. We start in a state in which our input VS is bound to the list AB and we know that PS is empty because it just happened there, right? Um, the next thing that we do is we enter the loop, and now we have a, des a decision. Is the first value V, so in our case A, is it positive or not? But well, we don't know. Because we don't know, we have to explore both possibilities. So let's say that we first explore the possibility in which A is greater than zero. What I will do is I will emit a logical constraint, is greater than zero, I will attach it to this edge, and I will remember it. This is called a path condition. 
If I enter this then branch, then what do I do? Well, I insert A to the beginning of the list PS, and now I'm in this state, right? The variable PS holds A, the list A. Now I go back to the beginning of the loop, and now V is bound to B, and I have to do the same trick. I have to decide whether I will consider B uh, greater than zero or B is less than or equal to zero. So for fun, let's say that we consider the possibility that B is less than or equal to zero. So what happens in the loop? Nothing, Nothing. we just exit. And we're done. Uh, all we need to do now is evaluate this assertion. Is this assertion true in this state? No, because VS has length two and PS has length one. But note that when I collect all these conditions that I've emitted on these branches, I have a full encoding of the meaning of this program along this path, right? I will do that for every single path in this program, and here is the meaning of the entire program as encoded by symbolic execution. Okay, so what is a clear disadvantage of this approach? It's exponential, right? There's essentially exponentially many paths uh, in the program with respect to the size of the control flow graph. So that's the problem. But it does have a really nice property. And the nice property is the following. Observe that the program uses lists, right? It has loops, it has lists, it does list insertions. These are all things that, the, that a, a, an, an SMT solver hates. It, it really does not want to deal with this. But the thing that's really nice is that we were able to partially, concretely evaluate away all of these operations, and what comes out is a formula over the basic symbolic data types. So even though your program has crazy constructs in it, as far as the solver is concerned, what you give to the solver is just a very simple formula. It's only talking about integers. So this is what we like, what we don't like is the exponential explosion. Now, the alternative is something called bounded model checking, which avoids the exponential explosion problem. We will see how. So the first thing that happens is uh, pretty much the same as before. Um, we start in a state in which VS is bound to AB and PS is bound to the empty, empty list. We execute both branches, but instead of exploring each path individually, once we execute the two branches of the conditional, we merge the two states. So now we create a new symbolic state that represents the result of executing both branches. So what does that look like? Well, I have labeled it here as PS0, but if you look at it, it has this funny expression here. It says uh, ITE, which stands for if then else. This is something that a solver understands. So if, if, um, if A is greater than zero, then PS0 in, the, in this state here evaluates to list A, otherwise it evaluates to the empty list. Right? You can see that this is, in fact, capturing the meaning of this conditional. The problem is, though, when we go around this loop for the second time, we're in big trouble. Because now we can no longer perform this insertion of V into the list PS. There is no list. We now have a symbolic expression. So what we're forced to do is we're forced to encode the meaning of list insertion into our formula now. So that's the trade-off. We have avoided exponential explosion. The formula is small, it's polynomial in size. It encodes the meaning of the program precisely, but now the solver has to be able to reason about lists. What it means to insert things into lists and so on. Now this may not be so bad when it comes to lists, but remember what our interpreter contained, right? Uh, it had mutation and so on, many, many things that we don't even know how to translate. So the question now that we have to answer is how do we have our cake and eat it too, right? So we basically want a polynomial uh, or compact encoding, and we want the encoding to be over these simple data types. And it turns out that the answer to doing this is to change the way in which we merge values that are coming from different paths. So I will show you uh, kind of abstractly how that works, and then we'll see how it works on our particular example. 
So abstractly, if we have two primitive types coming in, so let's say we have two symbolic values A and B, we merge them just like Bonnet model checking did. We will create a new symbolic value called C, let's say of type integer again, just like BMC did. So nothing changed there, we didn't win anything. What does change is how we merge values of complex data types. So if you have two lists of the same size, the output is going to be a concrete list. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to push the merge function inside. So we're going to merge A and C to get E, and we are going to merge B and D to get F. But now if you do a list insert function on this, there's no problem, because this is just a racket list, it's just that the contents are symbolic. Finally, the tricky part is what happens when you have two values that cannot be merged by these simple means. So they're neither two data structures with the same shape, nor are they the primitive values. How do you merge them? Uh, and Rosette introduces a new kind of symbolic value which is called a symbolic union. In fact, if you run any Rosette programs, you will run into these things. You can actually observe them and see what they look like inside. Um, but essentially, if you have, let's say, an integer A uh, and an empty list, we're going to create this union which says that if the guard is false, this formula G, I call it a guard, uh, then this union evaluates to A, and if the guard is true, the union evaluates to the empty list. Rosette main, maintains the invariant that this union is constructed in such a way that only one of these guards ever evaluates to true. So whatever assignment of constant uh, uh, concrete values or symbolic values the solver gives you, all of these unions are going to collapse into a single value. So let's see how that works on our example. Well, the first two steps are the same as modern model checking. Uh, we start in our initial state, we execute both branches, and now we need to merge. How are we going to merge this? What do we have to do? Are they primitive types? Uh, are they data types with the same shape? Different lengths, so what do we have to do? Unions. So here it is, we create a union. Um, and I am writing here, I'm just using these symbols here because the expressions themselves are a little bit too big to fit on the slide. So here you can see that this G0 says if A is greater than zero, uh, then it evaluates to the list A, otherwise it evaluates to the empty list. Now what happens when we go around the loop for the second time with V bound to B, we can do something really cool. Instead of encoding the meaning of this list insertion as a formula, we can actually execute it by pushing it inside of the union and applying it to member of the members of the union, right? So you can see that this is a perfectly valid transformation. At the end of this then branch, we're in a state in which if G0 is true, then the output is the list BA, otherwise the output is the list B. In the else branch, if B is um, less than or equal to zero, nothing happens. We just push the old state through. And now what we need to do is we need to merge these two states. So what would happen if I did this naively? If I, if I just treated these unions as sets and I took the union of the two sets, what would happen? Yes, but worse. What would happen with the size of my encoding. A giant, yes. Uh, yeah, you would get exponential explosion. For a list of size n, the union at the end would be of size two to the n if you do this naive merging. So what Rosette does instead, uh, it uses a special way to merge these unions, uh, which essentially ensures that the final encoding is polynomial, and it does so by maintaining the following invariant. Every union contains at most one value of a given primitive type and at most one instance of a given a data structure shape. So a union cannot contain more than one list of size one, more than one list of size two, more than one list of size three, and so on. So how do we accomplish that? Well, here we have two lists of size one. We're going to merge them and we're going to recalculate the guards so that everything is still logically true, we have one list of size two and we have one list of size zero. And you can see that if you extend this reasoning, if you have a list of size n, the final union is going to contain only n elements.
because of this invariant. When we exit the loop and we check the assertion, uh, we can see that this assertion is really true only here, right, on this list. And what we send to the solver are these three formulas, which are just a very long way to write the formulas that we've seen at the beginning. So this encodes the residual semantics of this program, a is greater than zero, b is greater than zero. And we have what we wanted, we have a polynomial encoding for this program, and it has this property that you can concretely evaluate complex constructs in the language that you don't want to encode and send to the solver. So this is basically how Rosetta works. So I will spend the last uh, 10 minutes or so uh, by telling you a little bit about three recent applications of Rosetta. Uh, that I'm uh, excited about. So here is a small list, subset of the ones that have been developed entirely. The rest of them didn't fit on the slide. Um, but I will focus on these three. So the first one is um, Verifier for a data flow language, a DSL called Epix. Has anyone heard of Epix? Wow. <laughs> I think this is the first yes that I've ever had to answer this question. Um, it is um, used to control scientific uh, equipment. It was basically built by physicists, uh, and they use it to control billions of dollars of scientific equipment, so telescopes and so on. And the problem with Epix is that, uh, well, it was built by physicists. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, it is actually a very nice language, and essentially uh, you write uh, data flow programs in them, and one kind of data flow program that was written in it um, is the control software for this radiotherapy machine. This is a real radiotherapy machine that's running at UW. It is a very unique system. It treats uh, cancers with neutron radiation. Normally people use uh, electrons or protons, uh, but neutrons are uh, capable of treating tumors that are otherwise resistant, resistant to radiation. The problem is that Creating one of these machines, accelerating the neutrons is so expensive. There is this tiny, tiny number of them in the entire world. I think there may be three in the US. One of them is at UW. Because these machines are so expensive, these installations have to live for a really long time. This one has been around for 30 years. The first control software for this machine was written in Fortran. They rewrote it in C in the 90s. And a few years ago, uh, they started rewriting it and, uh, and actually are done at this point in Epix. And the reason is that they had to keep up to date with the hospital system, with the prescription system, and also the code for the actual neutron accelerator is written in Epix as well. So they wanted everything to be in the same language. So what we did is um, we essentially built uh, uh, an interpreter for Epix in Rosette, and we used that interpreter to build a verifier for Epix, and we managed to find safety critical faults that would have caused the beam, the radiation beam, not to shut off when it was supposed to uh, with this verifier. That's a verifier program written in Epix. That's, that's it's correct. Not Epix uh, it's not verifying Epix itself, programs written in Epix. Um, so it found several of these defects, and it is used today, so the CNTS engineers uh, who we collaborate with um, are continuing to use this verifier whenever they update the code, whenever they uh, modify it in any way, they run the verifier to make sure that everything still works and everything is still correct. And these are huge programs. Um, when we translate the semantics of epics, when you essentially write a reset program, there are tens of thousands of lines of code, and the verification runs in seconds. All right, so the second one is an educational application. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of it, but uh, there's a company in Seattle called Enlearn, and what they do is they build educational tools, educational math games, and so on. Uh, they're using Rosette uh, to do exactly that. So they have already built math games that have been released to thousands of students uh, in a pilot study in India, uh, and essentially uh, they use Rosette to generate programs uh, or actually problems, inputs that reveal student misunderstanding. For example, if you teach a student how to uh, do long addition or long division, uh, they're essentially executing an algorithm, right? If you encode that algorithm in Rosette, you can generate programs that exercise all paths 
or if the student got something wrong, you can generate problems that will lead them, that will give them more opportunity to practice on that particular mistake that they made. Uh, they're now building, so that's very exciting. It's basically the engineers at NLEARN using Rosette, but even more exciting, they're building a DSL on top of Rosette, which will in the future enable teachers to build their own educational games and tools, which is really cool. And the final, uh, the, the final uh, application is, uh, you know, going back to low level to kind of stick with the uh, low level theme here, uh, is a super optimization framework uh, that was built on top of Rosette by uh, Mengpo uh, uh, and her colleagues at Berkeley and UW. So does anyone know what super optimization is? Uh, instruction set architecture. So x86 ARM. Does anyone know what super optimization is? Wow. Excellent, so we have a lot of people who know. So for those of you who don't know, um, normally writing a compiler uh, is really hard. So one of the things that's really hard about writing a compiler is that uh, you have to emit efficient code and you do that by rewriting it, right? You have to come up with rewrites and if you want to make it run very well on a specific architecture, you will have to also come up with architecture specific rewrites. <laughs> This is really time consuming and, 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 and it's really difficult work. So super optimization allows you not to write those rewrite rules. So here's how it works. You generate essentially naive x86. Your tool, the super optimizer, uh, will look at sequences, straight line sequences of code, let's say five lines at a time, 10 lines at a time, you know, however much it can scale. And then it will search the space of all possible x86 programs that are faster according to some performance function than that fragment that you gave it. This is called super optimization, and it's super optimization in the sense that you don't uh, have to write the rewrite rules, you actually just do brute force search. It's not really brute force search because I wouldn't scale, of course. Uh, it's much more sophisticated than that, but uh, super optimization is really cool. People have built super optimizers for, for x86 and LLVM, but because building even a super optimizer is really hard, right? you're essentially building a synthesis engine because you have to prove at the end that the fragment that you generated is equivalent to the fragment that you started with. Uh, not many of these things have been built. Have been built. Uh, so what Mengpo did uh, she is she built this framework called Green Thumb on top of Rosette, which allows you to create for free a super optimizer for your favorite architecture. So she built one for ARM, and she built one for this very ultra low power chip called Green Arrays, which is 100 times more energy efficient than any other chip in the market. All you do is you provide a simulator for your chip. You essentially build an interpreter for your ISA in Rosette and that plugs into her framework and from that comes out the super optimizer that uses her uh, algorithms and Rosette synthesis as a subroutine. So she has some very cool results uh, on her ARM super optimizer is able to generate code that is up to 82% faster than GC, uh, GCO3. And um, for this green array, this super low power chip, it's within 19% in terms of energy efficiency uh, of handwritten, hand-tuned expert assembly. And in some very critical routines, it's actually up to two and a half times faster and more energy efficient. Not expected at all. <laughs> <I have> no idea. <laughs> so uh, that's it. I will be happy to take any questions. Please check out Rosette. Uh, let me know if it works for you, and if it doesn't, we'll try to make it work for you. So um, can you describe some of the uh, constraints, what, what types of racket programs, for example, would, would not be able to work with Rosette, or does it cover the entire language? Um, so it will not work uh, if you try to use, uh, let's see, continuations or unstructured control flow. It's not going to work with ex exceptions. So the not going to work is with a caveat. So basically, if all you're doing with the parts of racket that Rosetta doesn't handle is apply them to concrete values. That's totally fine. 
you're just going to delegate to the record interpreter. Mostly if you're trying to do something sophisticated with exceptions and symbolic values, it's not gonna work. This can be implemented, uh, but it's very tricky, uh, and I haven't done it, so if somebody wants to implement that'd be great. <laughs> So um, economic modeling is very complicated, and there are a lot of people who make statements that are ridiculous, and I was wondering if your system could be used to explore all paths and find something that works. Um, I don't think I know enough about economic modeling to answer that question, so uh, I will take a cop-out answer. If you can write it as a program, we can definitely explore all paths. Since I'm going to be talking about uh, weakest precondition later on, um, can you tell me how your method compares with weakest precondition as a, as a, me as a method of uh, debugging code? As a method of debugging code? Um, so if you want to look at the constraints themselves, uh, it's probably not possible. So the, the, there's that, uh, because we explore very, very long executions, so sometimes you know hundreds of thousands of steps, the constraints that come out, the constraint systems are huge. You could not, I mean, I can examine them, but I've been doing this for 10 years, so I, I, I don't recommend, I mean, it, it would not help anyone else. I, I just wanted to make sure I understand. The symbolic constants can't, cannot take on values such as uh, strings or arbitrary length lists. Is That's correct. Right? But if you, um, if you limit the size of those artificially, can you get a detraction at all? Yes. A list of, give me a list of like, you know, six or less that shows the yes. Problem. Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, this is this is basically bounded reasoning. Uh, if you're able to give me bounds on your input, so I want to consider all lists of integers of size up to six, no problem. Okay. It's basically it cannot handle unbound data types. Um, as far as strings go, uh, SMT solvers do support they call the theory of strings, uh, and in fact, there's a student. Uh, right now who is working on adding strings uh, to Rosette as part of a testing tool that she's building at Amazon. So in, in light of that, um, is it possible and maybe is, would it be a good idea uh, to try to use Rosette in, um, in, a, in a 101 or in a, in a first programming class? <laughs> I've never tried it, <laughs> so um, I, 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 yeah, sounds ambitious. Um, one question that I had is, compared to something like ACL2, it seems like you, um, like the set of problems that you can write is quite small and similar. I feel like ACL2 is also quite small. Um, can, have you been, done any comparison between the kinds of things that you can verify versus ACL2 verified things? And the reason I think about this may, mainly is because ACL2 has been used in intro classes extremely successfully. Mm -hmm. So my understanding is that ACL2 can uh, actually do proofs over unbounded data types. So that would be the main difference. So in Rosette, you definitely cannot reason about unbounded data types. Actually, there are tricks uh, that, that would allow you to reason um, over unbounded loops and unbounded values if you're willing to provide loop invariance and if you're willing to do loop cuts yourself. Um, so there is actually a paper that shows how you could do that in a system that supports symbolic evaluation, and since Rosa does, you actually could uh, do that. But I've um, maybe an advanced graduate course, so I certainly teach this in my grad course, but I don't know if I would dare unleash it on my undergrad. <laughs> so the previous question a little bit. Um, I see another uh, concolic testing library that uses The search space. Uh, absolutely, yeah. That's not something that's built in uh, currently, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can, so most of the kind of advanced applications of Rosette, um, they, they do that sort of thing. They kind of add new annotations, new constructs, and they translate that down to kind of primitive Rosette forms. So um, they will put bounds and so on, depending on whatever your surface language allowed you to express. All right, so please, everyone, a big round of applause for Emina.
All right, so now we have a short break of about half an hour.